coach, speaker, motivator, and a leader who has four values rooted in the military as the son of an Air Force fighter pilot. Mr. Logan completed his undergraduate degree at Northern Arizona University and followed that by completing his Master's in Business Administration here locally at the University of Arizona. Mr. Logan first at the University of Arizona where he led his team to three consecutive bowl games. He then went on to become a head coach in the Italian American football team. After this, Mr. Logan worked as a sales manager for AT&T Computer Systems, where he was highly successful for the last 28 years. Mr. Logan has worked at the University of Arizona for the first 10 years as an associate director of athletics, and the next 18 as the assistant dean for corporate and external relations in the University of Arizona College of Science. In his time at the University of Arizona, Mr. Logan has played an integral part in the iconic biosphere too, and the Richard F. Harris Marathon. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Rob <clears throat> Well, Robin Williams and uh, Good Morning Vietnam is one of my favorite movies, and so I'm going to just start this off by Good evening, Davis Monthan! So I have to give a shout out to Colonel Turnham and Chief uh, Lida for being able to bring us all together. This pandemic has been unbelievable and for you to take the initiative to try it, and I hear this is the only installation in the entire DOD that's making an attempt to bring people together for an event like this. So kudos and congratulations to you. So for some background, I am a military guy. My dad was a 28-year pilot. He flew in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Not many of those around anymore. And I went to the Air Force Academy to follow in his footsteps. And then I quit. I came back home, and my dad was so supremely disappointed with me that he didn't speak to me for three months and I'm living in the same house. And it was one of my big regrets. But I have to say right now, uh, my dad died about 30 years ago, and if he could see me now standing, talking to the leadership of this base, he would be really proud. So I miss him, and we love this community. So we love this community and we love this base so much. We have representatives from the Desert Thunder, we have representatives from the Military Affairs Committee, the DM-50. And if there's one thing you learn about living in Tucson, Arizona, is how important this installation is. So I know you tire of this out in the community. Maybe you don't, but I think you do when we say thank you for your service, thank you for what you do. But on, from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom and representing our distinguished citizens here, and all the people outside the fence line, we thank you for what you do. Give yourselves a hand for your service to our country. So about a month ago, Chief Lida called me up and he said, hey, do you wanna speak at the Air Force Ball? I said, are you out of your mind? I, I, what am I gonna talk about? What do you want me to say? What is the message that you want me to deliver? And he said, you know, we're on this pandemic mountain, it seems like, and it seems like we're about halfway up. Maybe we're close to the top. And we are so frustrated how this has upset the apple cart, upset our lives. He said, why don't you just come and give us some good stories, give us some good thoughts, and help us get to the top of this mountain and get this over with. I said, okay, I can do that. I will tell a couple of stories. So what we're gonna do for about the next 15 minutes, we're gonna go on a world tour. We're gonna go to New Zealand and Antarctica. Then we're gonna go to China. And we're gonna come back to the United States, the Lake Placid, New York, celebrating the 40 year anniversary of the US beating the Russians in hockey. So the first place we're gonna go is New Zealand. And in November 21st, 1979, New Zealand experienced the worst air disaster in that country's history. 
257 people perished in a crash that I'm gonna explain here in a second. And what they did, Air New Zealand, the, the travel airplane, they filled these planes with tourists to take them down to Antarctica, a place that as very few people had walked unless you were a scientist or a researcher. They filled these planes, this is the third or fourth trip. And you know when you do a long haul trip like going to Rome or Madrid, when the pilot gets up to cruising altitude, what does he or she do? Turns on the autopilot. And this was a 6,000 mile round trip flight, 11 hours of flying time with one refueling stop. So the plane is flying on autopilot and unfortunately, somebody at Air New Zealand made a change in the flight plan, the coordinates by three degrees. Now you to me, I don't fly, that doesn't seem like much, but over the span of three or 4,000 miles of flying time, by the time they got to Antarctica, they were 30 miles off course, flying the correct flight plan 30 miles to the west. And unfortunately, they were flying directly in the path of the largest geographic feature on the continent of Antarctica, and that is Mount Erebus. It's a 12,000 foot snow covered active volcano. The pilot and crew did not know that the coordinates had changed and they experienced something called sector whiteout. And this flight would do a figure eight and then get down to 1500 feet off the surface of Antarctica and scientists and researchers and National Geographic guides would be interpreting this landscape, but they didn't know that they were in front of this volcano. Because what Sector Whiteout does, it creates an optical illusion. The snow-covered volcano with the white clouds combined with the surface of Antarctica made the volcano disappear. And they flew directly into the base and 257 people died instantly. Now I know Chief Lida is out there saying, hey Bob, um, maybe not talking about an air disaster is the best thing to do to an Air Force audience, but there's a backstory here. Because I think this Flight 901 is an analogy for our life and what we're dealing with right now with this pandemic. So I'm gonna ask you, are you on autopilot right now? How are you dealing with this six months of shutdown? How many people have teenagers at home? And how many people are doing homeschooling with your kids? All right, this is tough times, isn't it? How are you dealing with the turbulence that you're dealing with day after day after day? What is your destination? How are you gonna get there? And finally, and the takeaway from this story is the following point. Small things, if left uncorrected, almost always become big things. So take care of the details. Attention to details, something you hear in the military all the time. You get killed on the battlefield for small mistakes, not the big mistakes. So New Zealand and Antarctica. Our next stop is China. And we're gonna talk about the Chinese bamboo tree. Now, bamboo, I'm gonna talk about this as a tree, but for those that follow botany and horticulture, this is actually in the grass family. Bamboo is a grass, if you didn't know that. The Chinese bamboo tree is an amazing product because it provides medicine. It's a food source. You've had bamboo shoots, right? It is a fabric. You can grind this down and make shirts made out of bamboo finer than Egyptian cotton. And it's a construction material. Bamboo shoots have a tensile strength greater than steel. And you may not know this, but there are a billion people worldwide that live in bamboo structures. That's a little bit about bamboo, but I wanna talk about how this thing grows. Because when you plant a bamboo seed in the ground, you need to fertilize it and water it and tend to it, provide sunshine, 
for an entire year. And at the end of one year, how much growth do you think we've seen in the Chinese bamboo tree? Anybody know? Zero. It hasn't broken ground. And then you have to do this for a second and a third year. Water that soil, tend to it, provide fertilizer, and after three years, how much growth have we seen? Zero. You have to do the same thing for a fourth year and then a fifth year. Now I'm here to tell you, if you're planting a bamboo tree in your front yard and you're watering that thing every single day, your neighbor is going to come over and say, hey, Bob, what are you doing, man? The neighbor is starting to worry about you. We're not seeing much result. I don't understand what you're doing. And then you will proudly announce that I am growing a Chinese bamboo tree. But what happens in the fifth year is one of the most amazing things in history. Because when this breaks ground in year number five, the Chinese bamboo tree grows 90 feet in six weeks. Let me repeat that. It grows 90 feet in six weeks. To give you a frame of reference, I asked somebody earlier, how tall is this hanger? He said it's 60 feet tall. So if you can imagine in six weeks, this thing is gonna grow through the roof of this hanger and then go 30 feet taller. So here's the question. Does the Chinese bamboo tree grow 90 feet in six weeks or five years? If you only see the end result, the end product, you're gonna say six weeks. But what's been happening during that five year period? The root structure of the Chinese bamboo tree has been growing 300 feet in all directions to create the base and the foundation to support this 90 foot tree. So if you are working on things during this pandemic and you have goals and dreams and desires of promotion or maybe a spouse is trying to start a business and you've been working on it for years and years and years with nothing to show for it, it's gonna be really easy to quit. And guess what? You're gonna have a lot of people, friends and, and, and buddies and associates and family members, they're gonna tell you, what are you doing, man? You're wasting your time. You are wasting your time, get on with it, do something different. But if you believe in the goal, if you believe in the process, and I'll tell you a quick coaching story. Somebody always said when I was coaching, boy, look at the scoreboard, great victory. And let me tell you, talk to any coach and they will say this, the victory is not what it's all about. It's about the process. It's about the, the months that we've been training where nobody has been watching to get ourselves to play like a team and get that victory on the scoreboard. So the Chinese bamboo tree, if there's one takeaway, don't give up, continue working on your goal. The third and final stop on our world tour is to Lake Placid, New York. And we are in a 40th year anniversary of the greatest athletic contest in the history of the United States, per, United, uh, per Sports Illustrated. And those of us that are old enough to remember this day, it is something that you will never forget. And what I wanna do is talk about this pandemic. We all think this is the worst time we've ever been through in our entire life. Well, I am an old guy. I've been through Watergate. I've been through Vietnam. I've been through a number of stock market crashes. Been through 9-11. There have been a lot of times that have been bad, ladies and gentlemen. And I wanna compare 1980 to today. So in 1980, inflation was 11.3%. Today, it's one or 2%. If you want to go out and buy a house, mortgage rates today, what, 3%, maybe 4%? 1980, 21.5%. The Cold War was going crazy. Soviet Union had just invaded Afghanistan. Iran and Iraq were at war. If you want to get a tank of gas, be prepared to go wait in line for one or two hours and when you get to the pump, maybe they'll give you five or 10 gallons. Politically, 
Our president had just resigned after Watergate. Our replacement president, President Carter, many would consider fairly weak. His most famous speech, his crisis in confidence speech. And then along comes the Olympics. The Cold War and the, and the hatred between Soviet Union and us was palpable in this country. And again, if you think it's a bad time now, you had to experience how depressed everyone was in the United States in 1980. So now I'm going to talk briefly about the game. We all know who won. We beat the Soviets. But I want to tell you what an amazing thing it was for us to win this game. The Soviet Union had won the following gold medals. 1956, 1964, 1968, 1972, 1976. They lost in 1980 to us, 1984, and 1988. They kind of dominate the Olympics. A hockey magazine chose the 1980 Olympic team as the greatest uh, hockey team in the history of hockey. They played an exhibition match the year before against the NHL All-Stars with a ton of future Hall of Famers on the team, and they beat them six to nothing. Conversely, our team was built with 21-year-old graduates right out of college. Herb Brooks, the coach, took half his team from the University of Minnesota and almost half the rest of the team from Boston University, a bunch of kids. And everybody thought we were going to get slaughtered. The only people that felt we had a chance to win the game were Herb Brooks and those players. How did they do that? They believed that they could do something that nobody else could do. And they had spent six months training to create a style of play that the Soviets had never seen before. And they trained to the point where they knew if they got to the third period, we would win because of our condition. They worked harder than any, and if you've seen the movie Miracle, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And so what happens in this game? Three to two, we're behind in the second period, and we score two unanswered goals in the third period. The second goal with 10 minutes to play. And you can imagine what it was like to watch this game. Can we hold on for 10 minutes against the greatest team in history? And we did. Before we went on the ice, Herb Brooks said the following. Great moments are born from great opportunity. You were born to be here. This is your time. And you are the greatest team in the world. So go out and take it. Powerful, powerful statement. That was the seminal moment for us to come out of that economic malaise that we had in the United States, a hockey team. What's the seminal moment we're going to see here shortly? I don't know. I hope it's a vaccine. I hope it's here in a few months and we can be done with all this. But you need to find out what your seminal moment is. So we went on a world tour and Confucius had a quote. He said, when you go on a thousand mile journey, you begin with a first step. And I'm here to tell you, I think he's wrong. Because you start with a first step, a map, a compass, and a goal, and where you're gonna, where you're gonna end up. And I'll finish with this one quote from my favorite coach, Lou Holtz. He said, if you wanna be successful in life, you need four things. You need something to believe in, you need something to do, you need someone to love, and you need some, something to hope for. If you can do those four things, take care of the little things, water your bamboo, we will get over the top of this pandemic before you know it. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me.
This is open our appreciation for you coming out and speaking to us today. We would like to give you a symbolic A10 contract. It will be presented by one of our Air Force Hall of Media members, Mr. Sergeant Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, it's cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So you know. All right.